Come on up at this time.
This morning, we are praising God for what He's done. Amen? Amen. Our sister come to us several weeks ago, and she had some questions about her salvation. Uh, there was some doubts, and uh, she has settled those because she's took those to the Lord. I did the same thing when I was younger. I want to make sure that you are also preparing for your one day home in heaven. Uh, but before you can have that home secured in your heart, you need to know Christ, and that's exactly what she decided to do. And we're praising God for what her decision was. We're also praising God for His, his salvation. And there's always a scripture I like to use when it comes to baptisms because I want each of y'all to think about your baptism and the supernatural baptism. This is the water baptism that John the Baptist baptized many. And there was other baptisms in the Old Testament, but the most important baptism is the spiritual baptism that she encountered a couple Sundays ago. When she accepted Christ. And that's only through the power of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist said there's one coming greater than I that baptizes you with fire. And that fire consumes our soul. So we're praising God for you. I know it's cold in here. Uh, but let this be another symbol. And it's a symbol to us. Because when you look at Colossians chapter 2. And it says this. For I would that ye knew the great conflict I have for you. This was Paul's desire for the Christians to grow and nurture. And in seventh verse, he says, Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And that's what I pray for her. That she would just continue to just abound in Christ's knowledge. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So there's a whole lot she's going to hear. There's a whole lot that they can teach her. But she needs just to learn the Word of God. Amen? We've got a lot of traditions we do even in the church. And some of those are good. Some of them ain't the most important thing. But the most important thing is Christ. So you can continue in that. This verse here speaks about this picture that we see today. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in verse 9. Through Christ you have everything. In this world, in this watery grave, it's cold, ain't it? We, we got everything that we want in comfort, but through Christ He can strengthen us. For ye are complete in Him, which are the, the head of all principality and power. And in also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. So you also are raised in this power of Jesus Christ. So as we see this picture this morning, uh, our sister going into the watery grave, that's the old person that's already been defeated. And then the new person rising up in the newness of life. Upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Christ ministry where they do children's church. We're going to ask them to come together this morning. If you would, just meet there at the back. We have leaders in the back. If you would like to go to children's church this morning, all the way up to age third grade, that is, and you can be a part of the children's church and those other members. Thank you so much. For everybody else, if you got your Bibles, we have a opening passage that you can look at right up here. You can turn to your Bible, Psalms 27, verse 5. And it sort of sets what the mood is, I guess you could say, through some of our study this morning. Uh, we're going to read this and then go to the Lord in prayer, but let's, let's just remember... Our sisters in the Lord, and that I'm speaking about is the Jews that are right now in Israel, in Jerusalem, facing the bombardment of so many enemies that are against her. Amen? We pray for Israel because we pray for their salvation that come to know Christ, but we're never against Israel. And so we stand with Israel, and by standing with Israel, by you praying for Israel, I promise you, you are on the blessed side. Amen. But this is a, uh, once again, in the history of the world, this will be a monumental moment, what happens in the next few days, I'm sure. So we are praying for Israel, we're praying for our soldiers, we're praying for their soldiers and what it means for those people. If you would stand for the reading of God's Word, we'll read this and then go Lord in prayer. And speaking of their troubles, look what it says here, Psalms 27 verse 5, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. All right. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. That's what God promises for his people. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we just come to you. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation and us being a part of this celebration of baptism this morning. Uh, we, we pray for Haley. We pray for her family. We pray for... Your future opening up the doors that needs to be opening up, Father, for her family. Father, we just ask that you just bless him in a mighty way. Father, we pray for Israel. We pray for your people. We pray for your nation. That is, Father, uh, so important to you. But, Father, we know that there's people that wants them destroyed, as they always have. Father, we pray for them. We pray for the soldiers and the ones that's protecting that, Father, through your hand. Father, just be with them. Be with our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those that, Father, are, are here to protect us, Father. We pray for the men and women. Father, we just thank you for what you've done. Father, be with us in our church today. Those that's here, Father, just turn our hearts and minds towards your passage because we all have been in a place of trouble. We've all been in a place of, of needing to really be ready to go and be set to go. But, Father, so many things can can fall into place and the enemy can take control of our minds. And Father, we just pray for that person who may be struggling today. That Father, they would listen to this message and you would help them bring them that peace. And all these things we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And by the way, this being said here goes along with what we've been looking at as far as the ready, set, go. And I know it's it's something that we heard as kids. It might be something if you're into competition of racing, you've heard them say when you first start off, when you're getting ready to hear go or the countdown for you to go, you're all ready, set. And that's what we're talking about as far as our Christian lives. I want you to be set. I want you to be ready. I want you to go whenever God calls us to the different places in life that He does. Uh, Brother Comer, who is now in Midtown in Nashville, which is one of our blessed brothers who knows Christ, who is now a part of our church. We have been praying for him as he's dealing with this amino cancer. And, and what it means in his life is he saw, we, we, we sort of celebrated last week of the victory he saw uh, with, with the, the options of the platelets and all those things. And now this week he gets pneumonia. 
And he was at a, a dangerous level with his temperature. So we're going to be praying for Brother Comer. But these are the words that he said when he was on the phone with me when I called to check on him a couple evenings ago. Uh, he, he just wanted me to know. He said, I, I, had, I, I just, just so loved that sermon that I heard and I was a part of because I want to be ready. And it wasn't as much about his uh, salvation because we didn't have a long talk over that several months ago. It wasn't about Comer's salvation. He's talking about being ready. He just wants to be ready to do whatever God calls him to do. Amen. And, and it was very wild in his mind and heart that he said, I had looked so forward to God opening up the doors. I had no idea that it was going to be with me getting sick. Amen. And, and I had no way to really tell him at that time uh, what God was leading on my heart this week uh, talking about Elijah and his life and what he had seen, the victories he had seen, but also some of the issues with trouble. Why are we talking about ready, set, and talking about trouble? Because being set means no matter what gets through at you. Are you listening to me, church? Listen to me say amen. amen. No matter what comes in your life, are you ready? Whatever gets through at you or comes at your life with whatever storms are you set. And we're going to look at that today. The setting of the story is King Ahab. Uh, we know Ahab was the king and his wife was Jezebel. And man, for 22 years Ahab had reigned and Ahab had changed the premise of God's people. He had changed the premise of God's nation, Israel. And, and he had turned it towards false gods. Uh, the, the worshiping of, of Baal and Astra, another false god. All these false gods uh, uh, had, had come to the surface during his reign. And by the way, we can see the same thing in our nation today. But not only just our nation. We can't just name, name, name a few political crowds and say that that's the reason the world's going crazy and all those things. Friends, it's all over the world. The worldview and the idea of the worldview is totally changing. So we have to look at this today. I, I, I want to give you just a brief overview um, of what was happening in these passages when it comes to our context today. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. But what happened in the 18th chapter, I'm going to tell you real fast because we're not getting into that story, although it is an awesome story about what Elijah did, but we're actually going to start at the 19th chapter. 1 Kings chapter 19. In just a moment. But the overview of what happens is Ahab. Ahab and Jezebel calls together, um, listen to this, 450 false, false prophets from Baal, 400 false prophets from Asher, who was false prophets following a false god, so that they could, now that's 850 false preaching, teaching people to try to confuse the people. Everybody follow me, say amen. amen. And it was their idea as the government to pay only those prophets. Hold on to that thought. We're talking about the time period of this, Ahab and his reign, um, somewhere around 920 B.C., 890 B.C., and they was already smart enough to do this then. Don't you know they're doing it now? Amen? Paying people to preach. Paying people to be the true church. Well, let me tell you something. We're not going against any churches. We, we want to preach the gospel message. And I will preach against anybody that's preaching a false doctrine. Amen? But with so many names I can name, we're not even going to go there. You better know where you go to church. You better know who is preaching the Word. You better not trust me preaching. You better follow it yourself. Amen. All these false prophets have been set up by Ahab and Jezebel to turn against the people from God. The true, one true God. <laughs> by the way, we know Elijah and his name means the only one true God. Elohim. The only one true God. And it was ironic in the 18th chapter, he come against that whole idea that there was other gods. See, there was a drought that was going on for several years. And the one false god, Baal, 
supposedly was the God of rain, had not brought any rain for them. So they started trusting more and more into these other prophets and these other teachers and these other preachers who were saying, well, Baal will save the day. She will bring us rain. The reason that she is troubling Israel is because of this false God, Yahweh. The one God of Elijah that is false. See, they had changed the story. So look in 1 Kings 19. By this time, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, 850 men that, that Elijah did that. It wasn't that he just went out there and killed them without something else happening. We find out in the 18th chapter that they all had the false gods had whoa, there we go. The false gods had their opportunity to have the bullock or the sacrifice to be burnt, consumed by fire. And then the true God, Elijah, had the opportunity. There was a few details that they didn't go through. That is that Elijah, with his opportunity for the, the fire to be consumed on the sacrifice, they actually poured water on it before it was consumed. By the end of the whole thing, yes, there had been those prophets that God had commanded Elijah to kill. Then Jezebel sent a message into Elijah saying, So, look what she says here, church. Don't you see this? In 1 Kings 19, verse 2, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Now, now what, what I want you to see, and, and, and these guys, by the way, we're using a brand new program up here on the screen. So this is brand new Today's the first day out of the market. It's doing great, but we've just got a few kinks that we're working out. So you just follow with your Bibles. Everybody's got... There you go. There you go. You can follow with your Bibles right here on the screen. So 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. And look here what says next. Not only did he want them to... Jezebel wanted him to be in fear, but he did become fearful. I want you to think about this. Elijah had went against 850 men. And he had stood before all the nation of Israel, basically waiting on God just to show up to consume the sacrifice of fire back in the 18th chapter. We're talking about a day ago. And now a woman writes a letter to this Mighty prophet Elijah, and I say mighty because in the context of what God used through him, he was mighty. But as a man, he was scared half to death. Can we get it? Amen? I mean, this woman was tearing him all to pieces. What was this Jezebel? Well, you've heard of Jezebel before. I'm not going to go into much context, but she was led by Satan. I've, I've said this as a funny, but... It's just the truth. If we ever had a mean, mad cow, uh, my dad would always name her Jezebel. That was just what he named the old mad cow. And, and some of y'all know in the context what that means because she was crazy. She was crazy. Ahab had a lot to have to contend with, but he was wrong. He was just enjoying what the world was showing him and bringing him. Well, this would come to an end very, very soon. I want you to note, note today, don't fall for Ahab's tactic in modern day. Christian values saves nations. Godless nations descend into depravity. Did you hear it? I don't want us to get a hold of what they had. I want you to see and open up your eyes what this worldview. Let's put a definition up there for Ken. Worldview. Uh, this idea of worldview can be defined as the basic assumption and beliefs we hold about life that helps us interpret and engage with the world around us. That's the idea of the definition of worldview. Okay? That's the idea of worldview. When I ask you what's your worldview, then I would tell you a definition of it. Or you would tell me a definition. And let's think about that. If the worldview is defined as the basic assumption and beliefs, do you not realize how far our worldview has come going toward the depths of hell? Amen? Can I get an amen for that? Church, wake up. Man, we're in trouble. Your worldview is different than you say, no, my, I still stand on the
the solid rock of Christ. I'm still set. Are you set? That's what we're talking about. I believe a lot of us have slid off. Now have I got your attention? I mean, we've been talking about being in this race, being ready, set, go, being on the starting line. And we're not talking about the finish line. Some of y'all be like, yeah, I'm celebrating, waiting. You're celebrating the finish line. You're not started yet. <laughs> now, get your attention. I mean, are you like the rabbit and the tortoise? You're celebrating the finish line. You ain't even started the race. And I'm afraid that's what Satan's done to us as Christians. What I, what I want to get your attention on is, is the context of what's happening here with Elijah. He had seen victory. Fire from heaven fall to consume the sacrifice. God moving in his life, using him to, to just move whatever mountain he needed. But then fear come upon him. The context of his service come into question. The context of what? Let me just ask you this question. Is it going to take a woman to discourage you? Is it going to take a man to discourage you in your service? Is it going to take a church to discourage you? What will it take to discourage you? You say, well, no, I'm not going to let nothing happen. You say, Lord willing, I won't let nothing discourage me. Because Satan's going to be there to attack you every day. By the way, if you're in ministry, or if you're serving the Lord, then you got enemies. Preacher. If, if you're in service and ministry, it's not always going to be easy. It's not going to be a, a, a rose bed for you on your ministry route. No, it takes you holding to God, being set by God. And that's what I want you to see. Here Jezebel sent in 1 Kings 19 verse 2. She sent this message. She warns him, if I may not die life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. Third verse, I want you to see this really close. 1 Kings 19, verse 3. And when he saw that, and the first thing that he messed up on, when he saw, the first context of him changing his heart. See, before he'd seen everything that God had seen. Amen. Now he was seeing things. When you start opening up your eyes, you can come to this church, playing you about this church, and if all you want to see is a big mess, you're going to see a big mess. Amen. If you come to Plainview Baptist Church and your heart and your mind is to set to worship God and what He has called on your life, then guess what? You're going to see exactly that. Yeah. What are you seeing? What are you seeing in this church? What are you seeing in your family? What are you seeing in the context of your ministry? If you're a part of this church, then why are you seeing all the negative? Then you're in the same boat as Elijah. I'm trying to wake you up here. You're not setting God. You're not trusting in faith in God. So he was trusting in himself. Look what he saw. He saw a lot of things. And that he arose. He decided to move. See, God had already always told him where to go, what place to go to, what to do. But now he arose. And look, he went for his life. And came to Beersheba. Or Beersheba. Which belongs to Judah. And left his servant there. Now I'm not sure if they got the map up there where you, you might want to pull it up. If we don't, if we don't want to do that today, we'll, we'll just run on. But in the place that he was running to, he was running as far as he could from God. Amen? As far as he could. That was the idea. All this was by his wanting to do this. But he himself went a day's journey to the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree. And he requested, look what he's talking about. Everything is about themselves. Now, if you're serving in the church, or you're serving for the Lord, wherever it may be, it better not be about just for yourself. Amen? You say, no, 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 it's never for myself. That means you're going to be serving everybody else, not yourself. Amen? It's about serving others. And so his request was about he requests for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now. Oh Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. Now he's discouraged. What bad has happened in the ministry in Elijah's life? You guys tell me. He just saw victory yesterday. He just saw the power of God fall from heaven, consume the sacrifice. What has changed in his life? Someone's 
frighten him. And some of y'all say, well, that is just so pathetic for Elijah. Then why have we so often done the same thing when we was in Elijah's shoes? You say, I've never been in Elijah's shoes. I've never seen the fire from heaven fall. Well, maybe you had the opportunity to teach a class and someone discouraged you. Maybe you've had church hurt. And I'm not saying church hurt ain't bad. It's, it's pathetic that we have people that wants to hurt people in the church. But no, God's love covers all sin, but God's love also heals hearts. We have to trust in God, not man. We have to trust that even in Elijah's shade, I can point my fingers all I want in Elijah, but let me tell you something. When, when the pressure gets put on us in our family life, in our work life, then where do we stand? It's easy to say we wouldn't do what Elijah would, but he is in a dark place. He's in a place where he needs God to touch him. And look what happens. I want you to see this fifth verse. And as he lay and slept on her juniper tree, behold, the, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise, and he was touched by an angel. Right? The question in 1 Kings 19, 3-4, I want to ask you, how many ways was Elijah leading himself? And how many examples does these two verses give you? Many, right there in the previous verses. But you see, regardless of how many times he was trying to lead himself, God was trying to protect him and set him where he wanted him. Amen? Do you realize God's doing the same thing for you? Regardless of where you go, I didn't say you need to run away. God not, does not want us to want to sin. He doesn't want us to even run to sin. But even when we're at our worst, God is still there. Amen? Amen? He says that no man can take you out of the Father's hands. He promises that. So where are we at today? Six verse, he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals, and a cruise of waters at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So he went back to sleep. Now, notice that Elijah didn't say a word, did he? Did he set up an altar there and say, God, thank you for providing my meal today? He was just there, wasn't he? He had prayed that God would take his life. He was ready to just let his life be over. This was a bad state that Elijah was in. This is a terrible state for his ministry. It's a terrible state for himself. Amen. But he wasn't set. He, he wasn't. He had been ready in his life, but now he wasn't ready. What had changed? He wasn't standing on what God had promised him. He wasn't standing on what God had told him. All these things had changed his life. One of the questions we have on our study app, and you can go there and, and check that out. It's, it's at our website. You can go to study with us and you can check it out. But one of those questions I'd ask, it's a deep question for us. We've defined already the worldview and what the world wants to change. We've already saw how people around us sometimes puts us in fear. But how is the worldview of the present time changing your family? How's it changing the family? And I put a little note underneath that, that if it's changing your family, the church will, will be changed or has already been affected directly because of that change in your family. Can I get amen? Yeah. Somebody wants to blame this, blame that. Why ain't we got this? Why ain't we doing this? Why ain't we doing that in the church? Friends, the whole world view has changed our families. That's what's called change in the church. Because you as your family has changed. You can point your finger up here all, all day long and I'll take the blame. Amen. But I'm not the blame. The reason the church ain't what it was, or maybe, maybe if we're changing, let us change for the good. Amen. If the change, if, if the change is, is moving in the, in the wrong way, then let us change back towards God. Elijah had changed. But he was still provided for. Seventh verse. And the angel of the Lord come again the second time. I, I believe the Lord was just waiting to see if he would say anything to him. He didn't say nothing. He, he eat. Some of y'all, I, I just want to remind you, I'm talking about myself here, is in the place where maybe I'm just doing enough for God. I, I don't need to thank Him all the time. And no, God, you don't have to thank God all the time. But if, we need 
need to thank God every day. More than one time a day. We need to praise Him for what He's given us. But maybe we're in the place that Elijah was. We're on a juniper tree. We, we've done seen our victory. Now we're just giving up. Well, God doesn't tell us to give up. Let me remind you that I have to remind myself in my life that until God moves you to the next place, then He's not done with you. Amen? So what has He shown you? If you give up, then you give up, not God. That means He hasn't given up on you. And the angel Lord coming in the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. Do you realize every single Sunday, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, I will proclaim and remind you that God is not done with you yet. Now, I'm not an angel of the Lord. You ain't got an angel with you. But you've got angels around you that's ministering to you that we can't even see. Amen? The Bible tells us that. Hebrews chapter 1. And in that, He's ministering to us today. He arose, ate first, and did eat and drink. And look what happens next. And went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Arab, the man of God. Is He now following God? I ask that question. It's not on our study yet, but is He following God? Well, let's look. Not first. And he came dinner into a cave. Now, Herod would have been the place that others had seen the hand of God in mighty ways. Moses had been there. David had been there. Abraham. Maybe that's why he went. But let's look at here who sent him there. And he came dither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here? The King James says, What dost thou hear? What are you doing here, Elijah? Who asked him that? The Lord. Had he went on his own, he's still not following God. Has he been provided for? Is God providing for you? Does that mean that you're all right with God and you're doing what God tells you to do? I've got your attention now. Now look, I'm just showing you Scripture. I'm talking about being ready, set, to go. And some of you, because you're set, you think, well, I guess I'm doing enough. I just relax and I'm just, you know, I'm just, I, I'm being provided for, so God's all right with me. No, He's just providing for because He loves you. Amen. But are you truly following His will in your life? That's another question. And I had to look at this myself. I, I turned this around on my own life, my own calling to, to know God. What are you really showing me? What do you want me to see here? Because He showed me a lot with this passage. I'd always read the story about Elijah being discouraged. And, and, and we've studied that here. We've had those sermons. But this is a different sermon. This is about Him being set up by God, provided for by, by God. But that doesn't mean that you're doing what God has called you to do. This is a reminder message to be set in God. And being set in God is different than obeying God. All things work to those that love the Lord and call according to His purpose. Amen? Amen? Does that mean that we follow Him the whole time? Of course it doesn't. It doesn't in my life. I mean, God's, God always wants to provide for us. So, so here's this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, and they had thrown down thine altar, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I even only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, 10th verse would make it sound like that he hadn't seen no victories. How well is Plainview Baptist Church doing? How well is Cannon County doing in some of our other local churches? They're doing good. Honestly, you say, Brother Dunn, now come on. It ain't like it used to be. It's not like it used to be and it will never be like it used to be. But for today's time, I see salvation. In today's time, I see other churches. People come to know Christ. Praise God. God is still at work. Amen. 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 But if you want to get on the Debbie Downer here, and everything's just bad, and, and everything's then you're not set like you should be. Because the calling of Christ never said it was going to look rosy. The calling of Christ said not everything's going to work perfect. The calling of Christ said it's not always going to be a, that bed of roses, but the calling of Christ said that I will be there for you. I will always have you set. And that definition of 
upset, by the way. Y'all have heard this probably your whole life, but the definition of set is to put or place, to fix or cause to rest in a standing posture. To be set. <laughs> Not just setting, to be set. Man, I am set. And that's what God has done in your life. You see, I, 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 it don't look like it. You, you got too much fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. And so we have to trust in God. And, and Elijah, Elijah was seeing this. As God was trying to get his attention here. By the way, in verse, and he said, Go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. Now, the first time we're actually seeing in context, God says, I want you to go here and stand. And behold, the Lord passed by. So the Lord passed by, and some of your translations said, and He passed by as far as the context of it, it wasn't that He might have or just the Lord passed around Him. Either way, it's the Lord that was there with Him. But what it was saying here, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and breaking to pieces the rocks before, before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. It wasn't that the Lord didn't have nothing to do with it. It was that that wasn't the main lesson for Elijah. That's what that context means. When you've read this before, it wasn't that God didn't control the mountains or the earthquake or the fire because He can. It's just that wasn't what He was showing Elijah. So this is what happened. The pieces and the rocks broke before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. By the way, all this, Moses and Israel had saw these same things pretty much in order. And we're not going to go there this morning, but Exodus 19, Exodus 34, you'll see where God showed His power two different times to Israel exactly where Elijah was. Guess what? That's what Elijah was waiting on. Did you hear me? I, I told you, the Lord wasn't in it. If the Lord wasn't in it, could Satan have been in it? Possibly. Maybe Elijah went to, to the place that God had put him and was just waiting, but he was waiting for fireworks like he'd seen a couple of days ago. Well, let me tell you something. God's not about showing you signs every day. Just because you have a bad day and you say, Oh God, I need to see your presence. Don't mean He's going to show His presence. You need to get over that and mature yourself. Amen? Everybody with me say, Amen. 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 You don't live by signs, we live by faith. And faith is not seeing signs all the time. Amen? If you come to this church this morning and you say, Oh, I want to see the signs of the Holy Ghost. Well, praise God, I do too. I want to see dancing, praising, whatever it may be. But just because I don't see that don't mean God's not here. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Amen? That's the difference. The power of God. And Elijah's life was so mighty that he was so discouraged. But he's seen something now. The fire was there, but the Lord was not in the fire. But the last part of the 12th verse, y'all read it with me right here it is. Last part of the 12th verse, read it with me. But the Lord, and after the fire, a still small voice. A still small voice. What does that sound like? A still small voice. Some said, what does it sound like when God whispers? I hear Him whispering to me all the time. Not audibly, but all the time I hear Him speaking to me. I could not make it through one sermon if I didn't hear Him and feel His Holy Spirit just talking to me and moving me and leading me. Amen? See, the Lord wasn't in all those things. And after the fire, still small voice, the Lord was in. Amen? 13th verse, and it was so, and Elijah heard it. See, he heard this one. That he wrapped his face in his mantle, and the mantle just means a cloth. It was usually an overgarment on what he was wearing, and, and he would use that to wipe his hands. He put that cloth over his face for the first time. God had spoken to him through an angel. God had spoken to him by, by audible way, and he hadn't covered his face here. He had covered his face. Why? Was it the whispering? No. It was the way that God put that relationship. 
It was the way that God reached out to him in that relationship. I see a small voice. Let, let me ask you this today. I know it happens in my house, and I do the same thing. If you walked around my house where I was doing uh, work yesterday, we was pulling weeds, and I had earbuds in, and I was listening to songs, and my son was listening to songs, and we all do this because it's our entertainment. I even study that way. When do we just have silence? I mean, just for a moment, right here in this church, let's just have a, about four seconds of silence. Okay? Just four seconds of silence. Let's see what it sounds like. Preacher done lost his mind is what it sounds like. <laughs> well, some of you thinking. But you know what? All this thundering of the clouds and the fire and the earthquake, none of that was God trying to get His attention. He was trying to get His attention by a still, small voice. How long had God been talking to him that way? How long God has been talking to you that way? You just said you've been able to hear You've been looking for the earthquakes. You've been hearing the earthquakes. You've been looking at the fire. You've been looking at all the bad stuff. And Satan's just laughing the whole time. You're a Christian. He knows that. He can't steal your soul. Satan can't steal your soul. But boy, he can, he can put you where you have a bad witness. He can put you to where you're not in the ministry. He can put you where you don't even want to leave. Now, life is proof of this. Let's what about your calling? What about what God has done in your life? And he said in the 14th verse, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Why does he repeat this same thing word for word? Almost word for word, a little bit in different ways that it's there. Thrown down thy altar, slain thy prophets with the sword. I, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take away. He's still holding on to he's wanting to give up. How many times did God have to speak a message to you before you quit giving up? Amen. And how many times till you come back to where God sent you? I don't I don't know, but God does that for you. 15th verse, and the Lord said unto him, Go. Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, uh, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat and Abelol, shalt thou anoint the, to be prophet in thy room. And so here's the first mention of Elisha, which is a protege or, or apprentice for Elijah. That was going to be major encouragement. Major encouragement. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah, or Eli, I'm sorry, Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which had not kissed him. Now, let's just hold on to this one verse right here. In the context of what's being said here, I want you to look specifically at the 18th verse. Can we pull up the 18th, 18th verse? The 18th verse. There it is. Yet I have left 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. Now, do you think this was encouraging to Elijah? Yes. Was it that he didn't want to admit that there was other people serving God? By the way, there's people serving God right here in this community. Other churches that praise God are still leading forth the, the praise and the power of the gospel. Amen. You're not alone. Yes, much has changed the way the churches look. People ain't the way they used to be. They don't want to go to church as much as they used to. Yes, all that's true. But don't give up on what God's going to do there for this community. Don't give up on the gospel. Don't give up on the proclamation where He has set you. Because what God can do, we can't even imagine. All this for the proclamation 
It was showing him not only that other people had not given up on God, but also showed the fruit of what he had done. See, if you get so discouraged, you'll never see the greatness of what God shares with you being the hands and feet of Christ. Amen? <coughs> Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, in closing. I'm going to ask your musicians to come. And I want to ask you this. Maybe you're in a place and you're, you're ready for the start line. You say, Brother Don, I've been years past the start line. Praise God for that. Then every day is a new day. I, I encourage you to do this. I encourage you to come to this place in your ministry where you, you have a restart then. Are you ready? Are you set by God's hand? Have you reminded yourself just how important God... He has provided, but how important it is for you to put your full heart into what you're doing. We've got a lot of stuff coming up for church tonight's planning. I wonder how many of y'all will be here tonight to help us plan out what the rest of the calendar looks like. Or, maybe you have more important things to do. I understand. But make sure that God's sending you and not yourself. Because I'll tell you what, I have very, I know very several things that we've got to do just today. We've got high school uh, dinner this afternoon. They do everything on Sunday. Amen. We've got to do that. We've got to be there all evening long. But, you know, when it comes tonight, I want to be back here. I'm not trying to put, you know, make you feel bad for not being here if you can't be here. The number one reason you should be here is, guess what? For the Lord. Not for this, these people, not for this church, but for the Lord. And if you're here for the Lord, then you'll hear, be here for the right reasons. Amen? This message is to make sure you're at the right place in your life. The rest of this verse, in Matthew 11, the reason I'm reading you this, I want to know that you have this kind of relationship. Then began he to unbraid the cities wherein most of the mighty works were done because they repented not. And this is Jesus. He went into a lot of the towns and he, he got on to them for not turning away from sin. Uh, woe unto Crossan, woe unto Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre or Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable in Tyre and Zidon at the day of judgment than for you. And so he, Jesus is really showing a different Jesus here because he's trying to get their attention. Look what he says next. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in, in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable in the land of Sodom and in the day of judgment than for you. And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and have revealed them unto the babes. And what, who's he talking about here? He's talking about the ones who had truly followed Christ. See, we live in a world that follows the world view. I'll admit that. And in all of our families, including mine, the world has changed a lot of how we think and do. Okay? It's a fight every day. Because the world's trying to pull us more away from God's church and His calling. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Can you imagine me preaching this sermon 25 years ago in the way that I have? Some of y'all being like, boy, that's going to be 100 years from now. No, it's right now. Amen. It's happening today. Are you set? question is, are you ready? For Comer, it means that he's ready for whatever God's got for you. Does it mean that you're going to be in the same boat he's in? You could be. So how are you going to be ready? Only in Christ. How are you going to be set? Only following God. And how are you going to go? Only in God. <coughs> See, the rest of this says this. In this relationship, here's what he promises. He says, I thank the Lord for those who has has been revealed to my power, my love. The wise and prudent know, but the ones that has been revealed, even unto the babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he that to whomsoever the Son will reveal him, come unto me. And this is where he's calling you. And is he shouting at this? This isn't a shout. Jesus isn't yelling. He was yelling maybe a little bit 
few days ago in those other towns, but now He's calling you. And when He calls, sometimes it's a whisper. Because God don't have to shout. I mean, if y'all saw the eclipse last week, that's what we should have been praising God about. Amen? When you saw all the wonders when you woke up this morning, you should have been praising God. That's Him shouting any day. Amen? Too many of us was sharing meetings about the world and on that one day we should have been sharing the glories of God because that's nothing to God to hide the sun with the moon. Come on. Preacher. Come unto me, all that labor are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Who's he saying this to? He's saying this to you, Christian. He's saying this to Elijah. Elijah, that's how God handles it. So if, if Jesus is handling you and His own people this way, how do you handle them when they're out of the way like Elijah was? How would you go after Elijah and say, Elijah, you got, you got to just look beyond this. I've got to encourage you. Are you encouraging others right here in this church like you would Elijah? Are you yelling at them? Are you, are you, are you playing in the saint and not encouraging them? Look what Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. He didn't say, listen, I know it all. I am all powerful. My attitude is this. No, He didn't bring in His attitude. He says, you know what? I don't deserve... Uh, he, he basically brought Himself. He says, I am everything, but I'm going to bring myself down to what, what, what you can understand. Lowly and meek. I try to do myself in the same way. When someone's out of the way, then I need to put myself in their shoes, not me trying to put myself on a pedestal. I'm meek and lowly. Take my yoke upon you, learn me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. Is any of y'all looking for this rest in your souls today? Are you looking for rest? I didn't say so you can rest. I said, are you looking for rest in your ministry? Are you looking for rest in your family? Are you looking for rest in your church? Then if you are, then be set in Christ. Follow in Christ. The last verse. He repeats this in a way. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Is it easy to be a Christian? Is this what he's saying? It's just easy? No. It's easy if we put it all in his hands. This is our sister. Colossians chapter 2 and verse in, in chapter 3. That if we are baptized into Him, then we're rooted in Him. Listen, if she stays in Christ, then things will be easy. She will find peace. Not that it won't be hard sometimes, but there will always be that power that's leading and guiding her. Amen? Let's stand. As we sing what song? Verse 73. 373. And here's what I want you to do. I want you, I want you, if you're here, and you're unsettled. You're not saved. Maybe you need to come to this altar. Maybe you need to change your frame of mind. Elijah had seen victories. And then he got to praise. Maybe you're not set like you should be. Come back to his calling. Come back for his purpose. If you're here and you don't know Christ, take the invitation from Luke from Matthew chapter 1. The calling for salvation that you have today. Let's sing it together.